Support for Louisiana, the state we're in, is provided by... Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It really became an issue after the 80s oil bust when you had a lot of wellheads just out there with nobody responsible for them. The cleanup of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wells. And it can be as early as six weeks of pregnancy. A startling rise in syphilis cases across Louisiana. I know what went on and nothing's going to change history for me. The 60th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We're in the 95th percentile of cancer risk. A Louisiana activist receives recognition. Hello everyone, I'm Karen LeBlanc. My co-host, Kara St. Cyr, is out on assignment and contributed stories that will appear later in this broadcast. Now, here's what's making headlines this week. Voters head to the polls on Saturday, November 18th to decide statewide offices in the runoff and four constitutional amendments plus various local issues. Meanwhile, lawmakers are under a January 15th deadline issued by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to redraw the state's congressional map to be more representative of the state's population or acquiesce to a court ordered approach. In Louisiana, black individuals constitute one third of the entire population. A new redistricting plan for Louisiana presents an opportunity to establish two congressional districts out of the total six. This week marks the two year anniversary of the bipartisan infrastructure law. The funding includes 60 million to accelerate the cleanup of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wells across Louisiana. The Department of Natural Resources is overseeing the well plugging process on land and waterways throughout the state. Here's a progress report, plus a look at alternative uses for these out of service wells. Along the waterways of Lake Arthur and Lacassine National Wildlife Refuge, herons and gators share habitat with abandoned oil wells and platforms. Relics of defunct oil and gas drilling companies that left the structures for the state to clean up. So what you'll be seeing today is the project removal consists of multiple parts. One is removal of the oil and gas wells, but one of the larger parts is removal of out of service production facilities. So this is the one that was just removed from the field, which was a floating production barge. So you'll see the stock tanks that has oil and water and just sludge in the bottom of it. Across Louisiana, approximately 4,600 oil or gas wells sit abandoned, deemed orphans by the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources, charged with capping and cleaning up the sites. It really became an issue after the 80s oil bust when you had a lot of wellheads just out there with nobody responsible for them and no real way to do anything about them. So we create the oil field site restoration program where a fee is paid by operators, so much per barrel of oil, so much per thousand cubic feet of gas, to fund a program to start plugging these wells. When the bond requirements kicked in for wellheads, some companies couldn't comply. Others lost the right to operate for not following the rules. Louisiana's Department of Natural Resources is cleaning up the mess with funds from the federal bipartisan infrastructure law and hired contractors with the expertise to do the work. This is just where we finished up pulling out a well here, and um, as you can see, it looks like it's never been here. 
capping a well and removing its platform can be a complicated process. Workers pour cement down into the well to seal it up, then they cut and remove the casing. With floating production barges, the process can be more involved, requiring equipment removal and the cleaning and dismantling of different parts and pieces. It's like what you're watching here. A standard easy well can be abandoned on these deeper South Louisiana wells in a matter of three to four days. A complicated well could be three to four weeks. A facility with no issues could be pulled out and removed in one week. In 2023, 630 orphaned wells have been plugged. That's according to the Department of Natural Resources, and it's more than triple the yearly average. Funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law has accelerated the well capping. Governor John Bell Edwards recently toured these same waters to survey the ongoing work that the state is overseeing on behalf of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service in the Lacassine National Wildlife Refuge. We're making tremendous progress, and of course, we will get more funding uh, through the formula of the bipartisan infrastructure law because it's a five-year program. Nearly two-thirds of these abandoned wells are concentrated in the northern part of the state, mainly natural gas wells from the Haynesville Shale, a layer of sedimentary rock. These orphaned wells, are they uh, posing environmental and health risks? Every orphaned well does present that potential because you have a connection between a deep underground layer where you know at some point there was methane, there was crude oil, and guarantee there's very, very concentrated brine, salt water that is not good for anything on the surface. The remnants of the well platforms jutting out of the water or hidden below its surface also pose navigation risk for watercraft. There is a positive purpose, though, for some of the locations of these orphaned well sites that serve as artificial reefs. So we've identified over 100 sites so far that platforms are scheduled to be removed, and, and we're following up on those one by one with our replacement programs. When a wellhead or a platform is removed from the water, it takes with it marine habitat, an underwater ecosystem that has evolved around the base. The Coastal Conservation Association of Louisiana is working to repurpose platforms as artificial reefs. In this case, it was a helipad from a production platform. This provides an attachment point for the marine organisms to start the food chain, which also in turn goes up through the bait fish and through our sport fish. So this is a very important part of our habitat and our ecosystem. From a Gulf of Mexico perspective, this is a very important area for us. Uh, we have a lot of platforms out here, so it's, it's one of those things where we've worked with CCA over the years to look at opportunities where we can make smart investments that will, that will benefit the environment as well as the communities, and in this case, our angler community. The state is applying for another round of funding, up to $88 million, to continue capping those wells on land and water. Syphilis is a bacterial infection that causes lesions and bumps. In severe cases, it can cause brain damage or even death. In the past three years, the number of syphilis and congenital syphilis cases in Louisiana has increased exponentially, prompting the CDC to recommend testing to reduce case numbers. Here's a look at why the infection is spreading so quickly and what can be done to stop it. An outbreak is sweeping the American South. Venereal diseases are on the rise among almost all demographics. Syphilis rates in particular are skyrocketing. Numbers from the CDC show a surge of sexually transmitted infections in the United States with no signs of slowing. We're seeing a spike in women, pregnant women, in counties across the U.S., which is unusual. Syphilis is a bacterial infection caused by Treponema pallidum. Cases peaked in 1950, but more than 70 years later, the U.S. is experiencing another boom, especially in southern states like Louisiana. The problem that is that sometimes it goes undetected because it doesn't cause any symptoms. Dr. Edward Vayon specializes in maternal fetal medicine at Women's Hospital. He says the lack of detection is contributing to the boom. Well, it can be a lesion um, or a bump, it's painless. And sometimes if it's inside the vagina or on the cervix, the patient's not gonna know that it's there. Then what happens is that 
Um, this lesion will heal in two to three weeks independent of whether or not the patient received treatment. Okay, so the lesion is gonna heal and go away, but the syphilis infection will still persist. In Louisiana, cases of syphilis are beating national records. From 2020 to 2021, the diagnoses increased by 36%, meaning that for every 100,000 people, about 22 had the disease. Louisiana ranked 11th in the country for highest syphilis cases in 2021. When adult diagnoses increase, so is the likelihood that fetal cases will increase too. How is it transferred to a child? So one of two ways, baby can become infected. So either by the organism actually crossing the placenta. So that means during the pregnancy, it's in the mom's bloodstream, then it crosses to the placenta and infects the baby. That's the primary way, and it can be as early as six weeks of pregnancy, okay? So it can be any trimester, it's still just as serious, okay? Although obviously the longer that it was present, the more chances there are cause of, to cause the baby significant problems. The second way is through delivery. If the mother has a lesion or bump on or near her cervix, the fetus can come in contact with it. If a patient has latent syphilis, okay, and they come to the hospital and deliver a baby, well, that baby is going to be sent home before we realize that it actually has syphilis because it can be even three to eight weeks after delivery before some of these children have any symptoms of it. And the symptoms would be the same as an adult? So they're, they're, they're different symptoms, although some are similar. A characteristic rash, okay, is, is one of the most common things that's seen. They can also have flu-like symptoms. Um, and then this can progress. It goes through stages also. If it doesn't get treated, it, it can progress to your much more severe things, which is permanent brain problems, low IQ, um, blindness, uh, abnormal teeth, uh, problems with their bones, liver enlargement, lots of terrible things. Congenital cases are peaking in Louisiana too. In fact, the state is ranked third for diagnoses. Last year, the Department of Health recorded 115 cases. In a report, the Department of Health said that a lack of testing and prenatal screenings is causing the disease to spike again. Because the infection is so hard to detect, it's almost impossible to know if someone has syphilis until it's far along. Another issue is reporting. If a patient that's pregnant gets screened, they should all get screened in the first trimester, okay? If they're positive for it and it's confirmed, then they'll get treated with one dose of penicillin, one dose of bicillin, okay? And then it's crucial that they get retested or rechecked for it later in the pregnancy because you can get reinfected. Penicillin is only a treatment, not a vaccine, so it's crucial that mothers always get retested. It's preventable, 100% preventable if patients get appropriate screening. So that means if they get appropriate prenatal care from the, set, the minute they find out they're pregnant, they should start seeking care with a doctor so they can get screened properly so that it can be treated and therefore prevented. The Department of Health says that African Americans, pregnant women, and gay men are most at risk. LPB's Kara St. Cyr sat down with Louisiana activist Dr. Joy Banner as she discussed the legacy of her organization and the future of environmental changes in South Louisiana. Let's take a look. All right, today I have with us Dr. Joy Banner. She is co-director of the Descendants Project, which is an organization that's dedicated to making sure that black descendant communities and river parishes in Louisiana are healthy and environmentally safe. But also, before we get to any of that, you just won the National Preservation Award. And I just wanted to say congratulations. Yeah, yeah I brought it with me. Thank yes, you. Yes, <laughs> it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I apologize for any fingerprints. <laughs> But can you tell me a little bit more about this award and this honor that you just received? Yes, and, and it, def it was certainly an honor. It's the Emerging Leader, Leader Award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And um, it's awarded to um, emerging leaders, so maybe folks that who don't have quite a formal background in, in historic preservation, um, but because of their work, um, is, is considered an emerging leader in the space. So it was really, um, really honored to have been nominated um, to receive it and was a, a really surprised to get it. And yeah, and, and, and I'm happy to, to bring it back home with me to Wallace. So let's talk 
more specifically about the work that you did to get that award. Mm -hmm. So you focus a lot on environmental issues and health issues for black descendant communities. Can you tell me exactly what that means? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, first of all, I, I'm from St. John the Baptist Parish and we are in the middle of what's known as Cancer Alley. So because of, um, because of pollution and industrial encroachment, we have the highest risk. We're in the 95th percentile of cancer risk. So, and, and that's just one of, of numerous health issues that we have because of pollution. Um, and it's impacted our communities. It, it's our way of life. You know, we have you know, every the dust, the you know, the noise, the traffic. So it has um, it's it, it's impacted our communities. I um, in so many ways. So um, our organization is committed to protecting our communities, protecting our health, um, and finding ways, or even not even finding ways, returning to ways where we can have safe, healthy development. So let's talk about the most recent feat that you just went through. Mm -hmm. You were trying to prevent a grain terminal from being built in this area, which is, of course, the main focus of the Descendants Project. Mm -hmm. How did that go, and did you think that you were going to be successful? Mm -hmm. Yes, and with the Descendants Project, when we formed, we were, we, um, our mission is and was about this focus on economic development, historic preservation, and environmental justice. And right after we formed, we heard, we learned about the Greenfield Grain Terminal, which is this massive 250-acre pro project on 1,700 acres of land that was illegally rezoned to industrial 30 years ago. Our fight was to return the land back to its rightful residential zoning. And we um, have been in the courts for the last two and a half years. In August, we learned that that land was returned back to residential. Um, I would love to say that our battle ended there. That was, a, uh, the I think, the most major portion of our battle. But we knew that because of the, the collaboration um, and the participation with the parish, unfortunately, we knew that we still were going to be targeted in other ways. And we, we were, and we are. And um, the parish president and, and the parish council has introduced resolutions to get this land back on, um, on, through the commission and through the zoning process, to get it zoned back to industrial. So we've had to have an additional hearings. Um, and fortunately, we are continuing to win in the courts. It's historical, and it, there's a personal connection. Yes, so historically, these black communities that lie in between these plantations, um, our ancestors, after emancipation and, and many and many times self-emancipation, and, and ancestors who fought in the Civil War, you know, came back and, and started our communities. And so it's an and it's, it's an extremely rich, um, important aspect of American history, of Louisiana history. And so um, this land is very is very personal to us. That's where we, we grew up. That's where we remember, you know, visiting with our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. And we want to protect our history. Well, you've won this award because you've done a good job of, um, of protecting that history and making sure that Thank the people you. in that area are safe. But what's next for you? We have a lot of wonderful cultural projects that are um, on the horizon. So we are expanding um, to uh, acquire other historic um, assets. We have to build, expand our capacity at the Descendants Project. So we are going to have, you know, more jobs available. Um, so that's, it's really, 2024 is going to be a very exciting year. And I look forward to being able to focus more on the, on the development, on the historic and cultural development and promotion. Um, and less on the environmental things, not because it's, it's less of an issue, but because I feel like we are getting towards the end of at least that major part of the battle. All right, mm -hmm. well, thanks again for joining us and congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you for having me. November 22nd marks the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. The events shook the nation and remains a source of conspiracy theories and morbid fascination. Louisiana had a lead role in the Kennedy assassination saga, from the trigger man to the person who helped prepare the president's body 
and the Archbishop who presided over JFK's funeral. Here's a look back at this day seared in our national psyche with a living witness, Richard Lipsy, at the center of the unfolding events. There really was not time for emotion. We had the emotion when we heard the president was shot and killed. At this point, it was all business and there was a job to be done. Richard Lipsy had only served in the U.S. Army for two years when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. Richard was serving as an aide to General Wheel, the commanding general of the Military District of Washington. On that November day, Richard, first lieutenant, would go down in history as one of the last people to see JFK's body. We had discussed that afternoon what my responsibility would be. And, but when we got ready to leave the office and he says, you, Richard, you stay with the body. Richard received the president's body at Andrews Air Force Base and then followed the body to Bethesda Naval Hospital, where he helped clean and prepare the deceased president for an autopsy and then stood watch during the procedure. I picked the body up, put it on the table, the steel table, and unzipped the body bag, put, put him on there, and then he asked me to help him, he and I, and, and to wipe the body down and kind of clean the body, and we did that without getting near the wounds. Mm -hmm. By the time they finished, it was close to midnight. At that point, uh, General Wheel uh, came down. The doctors left. I secured the morgue. After the autopsy, Richard received clothing from the president's widow, Jackie Kennedy, then dressed the president's body, laid him in his coffin, and followed the body to the White House. It was now 4 a.m. the next morning. Then. Jackie asked everyone to leave, and every, we all left, including the honor guard. The only people left was Jackie and the priest, and we went outside. So to this day, nobody knows whether she opened the casket or not. I doubt it, because it was a big, heavy casket, and I guess she and the priest could have but she, it wasn't five minutes, maybe even less, when she came back and just knocked on the door. I was standing at the door, I opened it, and she didn't even say a word. Because President Kennedy died unexpectedly and at a young age, there was no official funeral plan nor protocol to follow. Jackie Kennedy made her request. She talked about the priest, that she wanted to... Uh, uh, Which is the Archbishop, Archbi Philip Hannon, Archbishop, I'm from sorry. From the New Orleans Diocese, another Louisiana connection. Right. Archbishop Philip Hannon, who served as the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of New Orleans from 1965 to 1989, presided over JFK's funeral, delivering the eulogy. I said to myself, well, there's only one way to do that. And that's to say a few introductory remarks and then to express it in his words and to also use some of the scriptural quotations. In a 1996 interview with LPB, the Archbishop recounts his friendship with Kennedy, who would periodically call when in need of a religious perspective. Archbishop Hannon also presided over the funeral of Senator Robert Kennedy, assassinated June 5, 1968, five years after his brother, and the funeral of Jackie Kennedy, who died May 19, 1994. One after another, they were killed. Nobody expected that whatsoever. But they all, basically, they had a faith. JFK's accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was born and raised in New Orleans as a small child. He later returned as a 24-year-old man and spent time in New Orleans in the spring and summer of 1963. This was just months before he would fire those fatal shots from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository onto Kennedy's motorcade below, 
killing the president and injuring Texas Governor John B. Connolly. To this day, nobody's ever given a serious motive for Oswald to kill Kennedy. Michael L. Kurtz is a Southeastern Louisiana University historian and noted assassination scholar. He wrote a book, The JFK Assassination Debate, and believes Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone. In a 2013 Press Club appearance, Kurtz shared his thoughts. I believe that the physical, medical, ballistics, acoustics, audiovisual evidence of the assassination does <clears throat> prove that there were at least two gunmen firing in Dealey Plaza and probably three. 60 years since the assassination of President Kennedy. Has time colored or changed your perspective on these events, your interpretation or feelings about these events? I don't think time has changed a lot, but it, time taught me a lot. I, I, I realize now, which I probably as a young 23-year-old lieutenant didn't realize exactly how brilliant President Kennedy was. Over the years, more chapters were written in the tragic tale of Camelot as a Kennedy family legacy continues to fascinate future generations. I know what went on and nothing's going to change history for me, no matter uh, how many books are written and how many people think it was. You can watch Richard Lipsy's full interview on our digital channel at YouTube at LPB TV. That's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are with our LPB app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, X and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Karen LeBlanc. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.